Hi, I'm Coach Dan Gordon, and welcome to my podcast for badass entrepreneurs only. If you're an entrepreneur who loves hitting it hard, growing your business, and learning from billionaires how to succeed, then you are clearly badass and you are going to love my show. But if you just want to take life slow and easy, you aren't badass, don't even bother listening. For the rest of you, strap in. For badass entrepreneurs only is taking off now. Hi, I'm Coach Dan Gordon, and today I'm talking with Ian LeWinter, a man who is working to decentralize filmmaking in Hollywood. He wants to put the creative decision-making into the hands of the fans and the creators instead of the hands of the corporate execs. You guys know how much I love disruptors, and Ian LeWinter is definitely a disruptor's disruptor. We're going to find out how he's using blockchain technology to fulfill on his vision. You're going to want to listen to what Ian LeWinter has to say. But before we get there, know this. Right now, in this moment, you have the power to live your life unlimited. I promise to open your mind, to set your thinking on fire, to show you your superhero self that you've been hiding from yourself. Come with me and let's enter a new reality where your success can happen in an instant. Strap in. I get asked by my clients a lot. Coach Dan, how do I get rid of my fears? Now, fears are a strange thing. And look, I've, I've overcome a lot of fears in my life. And I can tell you that you can't eliminate fear, but you can definitely reduce their effect on you. And here's how to do that. I want you to take out a piece of paper and draw a picture of a monster on it. I, I, I'm not even kidding about this. Draw a monster. You, you don't have to be a, a great artist. Then tape that picture of the monster up on the wall in your house. And every time you walk by that picture, I want you to stop and scream, that monster's going to eat me. Now, I know this sounds completely stupid, right? You know the monster isn't real. I mean, hell, you drew the stupid thing, right? But that's what all your fears are. An illusion. There's something that you created in your imagination and then you convince yourself it's real. Now, I, I know what you're thinking, right? Some fears are, are true. I mean, like, look, if someone breaks into your house and pulls a gun on you, that's a real fear, right? Well, not exactly. See, your fears are never about the things happening in that moment when you're feeling afraid. Your fears are always about a future that you've imagined that you don't like. You're not afraid of the gun. You're afraid of getting shot in the future. It's like if a doctor said you have a life-threatening disease, you'd be afraid of dying. But in the future, at that moment, when he told you, you'd still be very much alive. It's the future that you're imagining that you don't like. And that's what's creating your fears. Now, unfortunately, we can't simply turn off our fears and emotions like Mr. Spock in Star Trek. And you wouldn't want to, even if you could. Our fears are designed to help us anticipate future problems that might hurt us. We need our fears to stay alive. However, what you can do is practice focusing your mind on separating out the terrifying future that you're imagining, as opposed to what's actually happening right in the moment that you're feeling afraid. Take a breath, look around, you'll notice that nothing bad is occurring. It's natural to consider all the bad things that might happen, but you don't have to get lost in that grand illusion of your fears. And remember this too, most of the things that you're afraid of never actually happen. Think about it. Your fear of heights, your fear of disease, your fear of ending up homeless, none of these have ever occurred. And chances are they never will. And if you'd like some help in mastering your thinking and reducing your fears, I'd like to send you a free copy of my book, Jumping the Gap, Kill Your Story and Take Action. Just text the word GAP, G-A-P, to my cell phone, 213-409-8366. Just text GAP, G-A-P. And this book will help you in recognizing the difference between the fears that you're feeling and your real world. Again, text the word GAP, G-A-P, to my cell phone, 
409-8366 and get a free copy of my book, Jumping the Gap, Kill Your Story and Take Action. Well, I am so freaking excited to introduce Ian LeWinter. He is president of Ingredient X and co-creator of Film.io. With over 30 years experience in the creative industry, Ian has managed communications and strategy in both tech and entertainment. His unique strategies have been used to promote heavyweight brands such as Toshiba, Intuit, and Tenet Healthcare. His TV and executive producer credits include Alicia Keys and Brad Paisley. Ian's most recent feature film is called 52577, which is the date of the original Star Wars movie was released. And it's about how that movie changed the life of a young filmmaker. It certainly changed my life. I'm really excited to talk to him about that. Ian is also a co-creator of a superhero named Blank, who was created in real time on Twitter in 2007. There's lots to unpack there as well. But the big conversation we'll have with Ian is about his company, Ingredient X, the film and software studio specializing in blockchain NFT technologies, working to decentralize the Hollywood filmmaking process with the creation of Film.io. Using blockchain technology, Ian is working to put filmmaking in the purview of the creators and fans rather than the suits and the bean counters. Ian is working to make the world a more inclusive and fairer place. And thank God for Ian, because we need this revolution in cinema right now. So let's begin the conversation in the winter. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Shock to the System. Hey, Dan, how are you doing? Real good. Thanks so much for being here. Can, can we dive right in and talk about Ingredient X and Film.io? Actually, I want to talk to you about what you said about your fears. Okay, for, let's do it. So I have a slightly different perspective. There's a metal brother who had cancer. Mm. And he said the change in his life came when instead of fighting his cancer, he decided to love his cancer. And the, the learning for me was, what if instead of fighting our fears, we love our fears. We, 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 we lean into our fears. Someone much smarter than me once said, you know, you can't get rid of your shadows, but what you can do is you can hold them out in front of you and be aware of them. But the idea is, is that you just embrace your fears. Anyway, that's. No, I, I, I really like that. And that, you know, look, we're talking to people right now who have a great vision for their future. And they're struggling with bringing that vision into reality. Now, looking over your super impressive resume, Ian, there's a lot of things that you've done that a lot of people would have been afraid to do or even try to do. So how have you managed your fears, this vision of the future, when starting something new or making a big ask or throwing yourself in the deep end? How have you managed that? An indefatigable willingness to fail. Okay. So how did you develop that? I mean, that's an easy, that's easy to say. I mean, I listened to other people. I started failing. It was a combination of making mistakes and, and running up against walls and not dying. You know, mm. I mean, that's, that's the thing is we're all going to fail, but it's not about whether or not you fail. It's about what you do once you do. One of the things I always loved was Walt Disney said, keep moving forward. That was mm -hmm. his philosophy of life, keep moving forward. And someone once said to me a long time ago, CEO's superpower is not making the right decisions. It's making decisions and not being afraid to make decisions. Mm. In fact, the better you get at making decisions, there's a really good chance the better the quality of the decisions you make will become, right? So, so it's, and, and, and for some reason, that was a really important lesson that I learned that I've always embraced, which is being able to make decisions quickly and being willing to throw yourself over the edge of the precipice. Yeah, but then how did you develop the courage to throw yourself over the precipice when so many people don't? I just kept doing it. 
And, and, I, and, and I, here's an important you part of it. Okay. You just say yes. You say yes. You literally, you have a choice. Every single place you go, you have a choice. And you can say no, or you can say yes. And I said, I'm going to say yes. I'm just going to say yes. I'm just going to do it. I have a, I have a thing within my company, which is I say, yes, my people hmm. need something. I say, yes, they hmm. want me to do something. I say, yes, whether I don't get waterlogged in, whether it's at my station or not, hmm. I don't get waterlogged in, is it something I want to do or not? I do shit. I don't want to do all the time. And, and, and that right there, Ian, that is so important. Because I think we've gotten ourselves into a mindset of, if it doesn't feel good, I shouldn't do it. Like my feelings are guiding me, right? But our feelings are wrong a lot. And so how do you think, and you know, and, and you keep saying sort of like, I just do it, I just do it, I just do it. But I, like, do you, do you think that's something that you were born with or something that you developed this willingness to step in the fire? Oh, I don't think it was something I was born with on any mm. level. I don't think anybody's born with that. I yeah. think that, you know, we weigh things. Is our fear more, is our, does our fear weigh more than our desire to, to achieve? Right. Because those are kind of the two things at play there. I want to do this thing. I want this thing. Yeah. Right? But I'm afraid of doing the things that it'll take to do this thing because maybe they'll make me look stupid or. Maybe I'll fail or, you know, maybe somebody won't like me because mm -hmm. I, I do it. You know, all the things that we put in, we, we use as the tools for not moving forward. And mm. all I can tell you for myself is I just kept saying, I'm going to say yes. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to lean into my fear and I'm just going to do it. And do you think you inspire other people to do the same thing? That's a funny question. I think, yes. I think that my team, as an example, mm -hmm. who are some of the people I inspire the most often these days, see my willingness to just do whatever it takes pretty much all the time. I, I'm going to level with you about something, as long as we're talking about fear. I've interviewed a lot of people. You were the first, you're, you're the first person who I've interviewed that I was a little scared of. And uh, uh, uh. indeed, Ian, that, and you're laughing. I think that I, I'd call that a recognition response. And indeed, you know, as soon as the interview started, you took control of it. You know, here's my question. You're like, no, 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 let's talk about this. So do you think that you like making people a little uneasy? That's an interesting question. I have a skill for turning the tables. Oh, yeah. It's a natural skill of mine. I like to challenge people's reaction. I, I think I told you this when, when we first talked that my ad agency once wanted a client when I used the word motherfucker <laughs> and, I tell used, story. <laughs> and, and I used that word and I was pitching this group of maybe seven or eight people and my partner was there and I was standing and I was full of passion and I was pitching. And one of the things that I really think is very interesting about working with people is you is how chemistry plays into the situation. Mm. And you don't have chemistry with everybody and you shouldn't try and work with people you don't have chemistry with. It just won't work. Yeah. Even in business. And, and you're talking both like client and business partners, right? Uh, everybody. Yes. Everybody. Because the thing is. We like some people and we don't like other people. And one of the truest old misdavages is people give money to people they like. Mm. They don't give money to people they don't like. And, and part of your job as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, is you have to ask for money from somebody. Somehow you either got to sell something, you got to right. get somebody to buy a contract, but you got to ask for money. Now, if you're lucky enough to sell a widget in a store, a third party store, you don't have a direct relationship. People are just making that decision. But if your business involves direct contact and, and, and hold on, and you had to get the store to stock your widget. So you had there to was get the store to stock right. your widget. You have to get your board of directors to allow you to keep your job. You have to get your employees to do things. There's lots and lots of things. And what I found is when I'm asking for business, if I can identify 
early on whether or not I have any chemistry with this individual or individuals at all, I can save myself pain and time by bailing. I mm. have given pitches to people where I've used a motherfucker type word and all of a sudden just seen, I just turned everybody off. So I use those F those, those things as ways to judge chemistry. And dropping the, that bomb into that room got everybody excited. In fact, the director of marketing ran out of the room, got the CEO and said, you got to meet this guy. <laughs> and the CEO of that company is now the executive chairman of Ingredient X and filming and, and, and one of my co-creators and a long dear friend that I have a lot of chemistry with. Wow. See now, but that's so interesting because most people wouldn't do that because, you know, getting back to fear. Oh my God. If I say the word motherfucker, I'm afraid that they'll get turned off, but it sounds like you're using it as like a filtering device. You're like, they're going to find out if I'm going to turn them off as soon as I can. (laughs) If I'm going to turn them off, then there's no way in hell we're going to have a good working relationship. But you don't open with that word, right? You don't go, hello, motherfuckers. I'm Ian. I can't promise you that I wouldn't. You got to. <laughs> I think part of your success is you got to read the room a little bit. But sure. But, but you know, I used to own that agency, and our biggest client was Cox Communications. We did like seven hundred projects for Cox over the years that we worked with them. Wow, and that's a lot of Cox. Guy the, the guy who was the v, VP of marketing was a pretty straight shooter, and he liked. It, even though I probably created a certain amount of discomfort for him, mm-hmm. he wanted to get excited. And if he'd been someone who was a meat and potatoes guy, we never worked together. Yeah. But at, at the end of the day, we spend our lives asking people to do things. Mm-hmm. And, and part of our ability to be successful is inherent in our ability to compel people to do things. Yeah. Advertising, the very nature of advertising is compelling people to do things, creating things to get people to do what you want, which is often buy stuff. Mm. And part of being successful in the entertainment industry is finding a way in. And that's really, really hard. In fact, it's what's, in my humble opinion, one of the things that's most wrong with the entertainment industry is its exclusivity. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have the right last name and I didn't go to school with the right people. And, you know, I just wasn't connected in there. So if I had a secret reason for doing this thing that we're doing now, it's because I intended to create this monster and leverage my ass into the creative industry through this thing that I built. With, yeah. And so let's friends. talk about that. Let's talk about film IO and, and blockchain. Which we call film IO, just so you know. Oh, all right. So sorry. Thank you. Film no worries. No worries. The rule is we write it F L I M dot I O because that's the URL. Right. And we say film IO and we never correct anybody, but you said it a couple of times when we're on a podcast. So, you know. I'm okay. Breaking. Well, I just, I just want my listeners to go to film dot IO. Yep. And yeah. I appreciate that. I really <laughs> yeah. do. Sure, sure. You know, I, I really like that that you have said that you want to bring fairness to the world. And I, I love that disruption. I love that evolution. So but let me crawl down yeah. off my white horse for a second <laughs> and be the pragmatist because okay. there is a pragmatism to the approach. So imagine that you're going to take on and attempt to disintermediate a $200 billion a year global industry. And you're a bunch of entrepreneurs with a little bit of money. Mm -hmm. I liken it to fighting dragons. And if you're going to fight a dragon, like we all saw in the Lord of the Rings, you got to figure out where that piece of its underbelly is exposed before you shoot that black arrow in there. Right. Well, so, If you think about the entertainment industry, it makes a lot of sense to focus on vulnerabilities. Mm. And and the first two that we identified were exclusion and that fans are an afterthought. 
And those were the two basic ideas. Would, would you say a little more about fans being an I'm, I'm going that, to. Okay, thank I'm, you. I'm good at it. But I'm going to start you. with exclusivity. So I want to make the world a better place. And it Such fits as? into this idea of inclusivity versus exclusivity. Okay. Diversity. Hollywood is not diverse at all. It mm. tends to be diverse to try and get people to love it for its diversity, but it really makes almost no headway in true diversity. When the entertainment industry was born, it was just a bunch of wacky dudes who wanted to make movies. And that in about the 60s and the 70s, it kind of started to corporatize. And Hollywood doesn't care today about making great content. It cares about making great content that makes a lot of money for a pretty small group of people. 80% of this global $200 billion industry is basically controlled by six U.S. corporations. And within those six U.S. corporations are maybe, if I'm being generous, 50 people who can legitimately green light a television series or a full length motion picture. And they're doing it based upon what's going to make them the most money. Do you think Filmio is going to be changing that? On Filmio, anybody can join. Now we're in stealth right now. So technically you have to sign up for a reservation. Once we're open, once, once and for all, anybody can join. And anyone who's on the platform can launch a project. So anyone anywhere in the world with a computer and internet access can launch a television movie or NFT project. Now, does that mean that their project is going to be approved on the platform? It does not actually. When you launch a project on the platform, it's in stealth and only you can see it. And there's three things that you have to put into your project profile page, your, your showcase page before you can submit your project for approval. And that's a log line, a poster, and a lookbook. Mm. The reason that we did that was we didn't want to be a place, as an example, like YouTube, where there's lots and lots and lots of content that isn't a legitimate story. Right. And, and would you describe what a lookbook is? It's basically a pitch deck. I see. It talks about the theme of the story. It may give examples of, of existing actors that would play in the roles, it would show locations. It, it's a, it's a multi-page deck that basically gives you the flavor of the movie. And then Ian, who and makes the choice put, about whether it gets greenlit? So once uh -huh. you have those three things in there, you submit it for approval and we're only weeding out for two things, hate speech and pornography. Mm. And hate speech is even a challenging one because if you do a documentary about the effect that hate speech is having on America, you're going to have hate speech in your, <laughs> right. in your movie. Yeah. But what the movie can't be a takedown piece of something or, or, or someone, and we don't allow pornography on the platform. And, and even that has a, you know, a place that you push up to and that you can't go over and that's explicit sex. Okay. Right. So. Those are the only two requirements and anything else gets approved because Filmio doesn't have an opinion about what's a good movie and what's a bad movie. That's left to the audience and the algorithm. Filmio is a, is a filmmaking DAO, DAO standing for decentralized autonomous organization. And I'm going to segue for a second and give a really mm -hmm. quick explanation of what a DAO is. So today in the world, we have a form of corporate governance where there is a C-suite and there is a board of directors and the board of directors have control over the corporation in general. The C-suite are basically the vice presidents and above. Now in a DAO, there is no C-suite and there is no board of directors and the decision-making for the entity are done by what we call in the crypto world, the token holders. Mm -hmm. And on the Filmio platform, there is a token called the fan token. 
And the fan token is the governance token. And you as a user of the platform have governance authority over the way the platform operates and you have governance authority over projects, what gets made. And we consider every movie and television NFT project to be a DAO proposal. Okay. And so basically what happens is you join the platform and we give you some fan tokens and we take the, and you take those fan tokens and you go to a project that you're interested in and you stake your fan tokens to that project. Hmm. Now those are still your tokens. However, as the project moves through a series of milestones to perfect itself as a project, you receive fan token rewards for supporting that project. Huh. And how many fan tokens you have is one of the ways that your governance authority is granted, but we're trying to create a platform that is diverse, equitable, inclusive, and fair. So only a certain number of your fan tokens actually apply to your governance authority, which huh. means that you're not going to control what gets made because it, we're trying to combat a world where four, four Americans own the same amount of personal wealth as 50% of America. And we think that, that governance should be based on reputation. It should be mm. based on activity. It should be based on participation. It should be based on the quality of your participation. It should even be based on accuracy. Hmm. And what I mean by that is if I support 10 projects and none of those projects get made and you support 10 projects and all those projects gets made, you should have a higher authority than I do because you're better at picking projects that have the highest potential for commercial viability because only the projects that the world want to see should get made which so, is what the platform's job is, is to have the fans support and influence what gets made instead of what gets delivered to the theater. Let me ask you this though. Let's say that I'm really good at picking projects that get made, right? And I build a lot of tokens. Now that puts me in a power position. Now can't somebody who's trying to get a film through call me up and offer me like $10,000 to put all my tokens behind this project. Wouldn't that recreate the problem that we're having right now in Hollywood? How do you avoid that? Well, first of all, only, only a portion of your tokens apply to your governance authority. So while yes, people who are more accurate and people who participate more will gain more governance authority. It is our job as a company to watch and realize what happens and to react to it. Mm. If we found that there were ways that the system was being gamed, then, then you have to learn from how people use it and what transpires mm. and to look for trends, to maintain your standards of fairness, equity, inclusive, yeah. inclusiveness, and diversity. And, and that's a word that keeps coming up in everything that we've talked about. Fairness, fairness, fairness. Why is fairness so important to you? There's a lot of amazing voices out there who could make unbelievable projects that will never see the light of day in the current system. And I am a movie and television super freak. <laughs> I watch content all the flipping time and I want to see the things that the people are going to make up. I don't want to, don't get me wrong. I yeah. like Marvel movies, sure, but there's too many of them yeah. and there's not enough other stuff around them. Mm -hmm. So from a purely selfish point within this industry and this place that we're affecting, I just want to see great content from great voices mm. from everywhere in the world. Yeah. So there was a movie called Force Majeure. Mm -hmm. And it was about a couple who was having lunch at a law, a ski lodge. And there's an avalanche. And the husband runs away without grabbing his kids and his wife. There were some of the most uncomfortable exchanges between this man and this woman that just, it, it'll, it'll just fuck with your mind. It was great. So what do we do in the United States? Yeah. We recreate the movie because that's what we do. 
And the one that got remade was a dud. And I want to see that go away. I want, I, I want to see America stop fucking with other people's content. So the selfish thing is Ian gets to see more cool content for more <laughs> people. The, the non Ian thing is, I believe honestly that we are a planet which is rushing towards implosion. We need to create a world that is fairer mm. where there is more wealth distribution. Everybody should have food, a roof, clean water, and air as a basic human right. And you know what I appreciate about Ian that's super ironic is you have the stuff of great entrepreneurialism. You have to have a sense in your head of my way of doing things is right and your way of doing things is wrong. It's it's necessary to even be an entrepreneur. You have to have that level of of ego. And yet the irony is you also believe I want everybody to have a fair voice, which is in in a way direct opposition with that first part. Well, you know, interestingly that you say that is that today, if you don't have the word disruption in what you're doing, nobody cares. Right? <laughs> right. You have to be a disruptor. Yes. You have to disrupt. And 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 what is the nature of disrupting but tearing down that which exists or replacing it with something different? Mm -hmm. So so the so we have reached a point in entrepreneurism where destroying that which exists is a requirement yeah. for entrepreneurism. Mm. And the other part is uh, everybody's saying, you know, crypto and NFTs are a scam. And I always say, so how's the last 200 years of capitalism working for you? <laughs> How is it that we got like five guys that have the same amount of wealth as 50 million Americans? That didn't happen with crypto and NFTs. That was the current existing corporate mentality. And this, this world needs a radical change in governance. Well, you know, biology is evolutionary and culture is revolutionary, right? Biology happens in a nice, even pace where we change over a long period of time. With our culture, it's the same, the same, the same until everybody's just sick of it. And then there's a revolution. And clearly that's what we're headed towards, right? Like there's the bow is going to break. The cradle's going to fall. Except here's the thing. It ain't going to yeah. look like 1776. What do I'm you think saying, will happen? What do you think will happen, Ian? I think that the, the best chance that we have as a global community is small, consistent, incremental change. I don't know that we're ever going to see a huge cataclysmic driver again. I just don't. You know, I could keep going down this road for like your thinking is, is really powerful and very interesting. And from a purely selfish standpoint, I want to talk about 52577. What okay, is it? Well, we, we only have a couple more minutes. So I know, I know. Right. Please. Patrick Reed Johnson. He's the, not only the creator, but it's a biopic. So it's a movie okay. about him and growing up. He always wanted to be a filmmaker. And as an example, there's one scene where he, his, his sister is brushing her horse. She turns around, he's grabbed the horse and he's painted it to look like a zebra because <laughs> he needs a zebra. She, <laughs> she, <his> movie. <laughs> right. Exactly. Her, his father cleans out the barbecue and the kid steals the barbecue and turns it into a space station. Uh -huh. It's basically this young boy trying to make movies. And as he grew up, he never lost his desire and his mom and she, you know, got on the phone and she got him an interview with an important person in Hollywood. And one of the things that guy did was he took Patrick around and Patrick met a guy named Steven Spielberg, who was at the time making those encounters. And then he took him to this garage where this other guy named George Lucas was making this movie called Star Wars. Wow. 
and he's walking around and think about it. I mean, there's a table and it's like the, the, the stuff from the battle star and there's like yeah. an swing here and there's like a, you know, a, 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 a tie fighter here and all this really cool stuff. And, and they allow him to go upstairs and sit in a room and watch an incomplete working version of star Wars. Wow. And he turns out is the first person that didn't work for Lucas that saw the movie. And this, and this is a true story. Yeah. As far as I know it is. Okay, great. And, and so I want to say 18 years ago, 17 years ago or something, mm -hmm. he started making this movie, but as the result of that, he met Douglas Trumbull, he met Steven Spielberg, he met George Lucas. He became a director and he wanted to make this movie about his childhood. It took him like 17 or 18 years and the movie is made. It's in the can. Mm. Uh, Filmio was a huge part of it. I worked on the movie for a couple of the years and I came to love the movie and the movie is is finished it's going to be in theaters later this year and it's really a romance and a coming of age story about a young kid who interestingly enough was as a very young kid sitting in a theater saw 2001 a space odyssey it was like okay i know what i want to do and he was like eight or something mm. and that aimed the thing i want to do this and yeah you know Wow, that's it's really touching because you know I moved to LA because of Star Wars. Like my life changed because of Star Wars. Like not just a little bit, a lot. And that, I waited and, online and then, for forty eight hours to see that movie. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It's, we slept out the whole thing. Look, Ian. I mean, I could we could just keep talking and talking and talking. You're a super fascinating individual and. I just, I really thank you for being so generous with your time and sharing everything that you've shared about your new vision for the entertainment business. And it, it really has been priceless information for my entrepreneurial audience, because the way that you think and what you do and your, your own brand of disruption is what entrepreneurs need to understand about stepping into creating massive change and innovation in the world. And so it would be impossible for most people to gain access to you, Ian. So having you here to share your stories is just a rare treat for me and my audience. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being on Shock to the System. My best advice is be a passionate pragmatist. Be a passionate pragmatist. Yeah, have passion for what you're doing, but be pragmatic about how you get there because it's a real world and passion will only take you so far. And and would you please emphasize again, because it's so important, the importance of failure. Yeah. You know, if you're willing to try, you will fail. If those two things are, are intrinsically linked mm. and you will fail more than you succeed. Every entrepreneur will tell you, I succeeded twice out of the 37 times I but it's about trying and trying yeah. is the journey and trying to succeed is fascinating and wonderful and beautiful and weird and fucked up. And all that shit. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. Thank you again for, for being here and I look forward to continuing the, the conversation at some point. Bye-bye. You have a great day, Dan. And before we wrap up, I want to remind you to get a free copy of my book, Jumping the Gap, Kill Your Story and Take Action. Just text the word GAP, G-A-P, to 213 409-8366. It will help you take bold new action on your entrepreneurial journey. Text the word GAP, G-A-P, to 213-409-8366. And I also want to thank you. Yeah, you. The you who is listening to this show right now. Thank you for opening your mind and stepping into the world of infinite possibilities. My guests, all of them, breathe the same air you do. There's nothing stopping you from taking bold action, opening up your world, challenging yourself to step up and live your life unlimited. I'm Coach Dan Gordon. Thanks for listening. Now get out there and show the world the next greatest version of you. Hey, if you have some thoughts about the show you'd like to share with us, or if you think you've got what it takes to be a guest, send me a text at 213-409-8366. 
Let me know what you think, or let me know why you think you'd be a great guest for this show. Thanks again for listening. I hope you're inspired to unleash your badass self on the world.